And uh, we talked the other day about good discipline and consistent discipline. And uh, there was an article on Alatea a few months back. I guess it was probably for the Feast of St. John Bosco. And it's called Seven Saintly Tips on How to Discipline a Child from Don Bosco. Uh, last year, we actually had a Salesian father and sister who gave an entire session on uh, the, uh, the Salesian way of, uh, of discipline. It's really uh, the educational or pedagogical version of preventive medicine. All right? And uh, it was interesting. We had a former uh, De La Salle Christian brother and, uh, uh, who is now a priest. Uh, and so we had a conversation between the Lasallian method of discipline and the Salesian. And uh, so it made for an interesting conversation. And then just, uh, well, about this time last year, uh, an article on internet uh, called Blessing or Curse. And, uh, and so again, I think that uh, these are items that, I, I, by the way, I think it's always a good idea with, with your faculty. Uh, if you find an interesting article, forward it to them. Uh, and not just to the principal, to, to the whole crowd. And, uh, and then if you're attending faculty meetings, which I hope and think you should be, uh, then say, by the way, what did you think of that article I sent you? Uh, and it's a way of, uh, of initiating a, a good conversation instead of you know, wasting time on, on nonsense that doesn't mean too much. So any questions about any housekeeping details we still have some of the Newman House books available. Uh, and um, someone asked about the book, that thick volume called Oremus, Let Us Pray. Uh, what is that? That's now a, we put this together as a companion to the breviary. Uh, with the new and improved translation of the Mass, you should notice that the collects don't match anymore. Huh? And so we took all of the colics of the Roman Missal and put them into that. So if you're praying lauds and vespers, now the colic that's in the breviary, which is really obsolete, you supplement by using that, okay? Uh, which if you've noticed with our, uh, the office hours that we've been doing, it is the, the, the new collect. And remember the point of it is, the reason that you repeat the collect in the office is it's an extension of, of the Eucharist, right? The daily office is, is the, the two hinges, the, the two big hours are the hinge hours, which flow from and lead back to, uh, to the Eucharist. So any questions about any of that stuff? Okay, well... Um, yes, yeah, if you're going to be here, you know, but... Don't lose it, please, okay? Because priests are like kids, you know? I don't know where I put it. <laughs> so, anything, any other concerns? Okay, so, um, who's kicking off for this session on going classical? It's me. Okay, Mary Pat. Good morning, everyone. What a storm last night, huh? Oh, yeah. Nature's fireworks, right? Um, well, I'm, I'm here today to tell you my own personal story of taking a failing parochial school in a direction that's commonly called classical, but later on uh, you'll hear from Mike Van Hecke and um, Elizabeth Sullivan, uh, a little more about that term. For now, I'm going to use it because it's the, the one that people identify with most. Um, yesterday, I spoke about the role of the priest in the school from my current perspective uh, at the Secretariat of Catholic Education and the fact that what I'm seeing and hearing a lot in the field is the unanimous understanding that our schools are broken, something is wrong and they need a fix, and a growing consensus around this idea that governance is the problem. And that is something that I do not accept as a, as a proposition. And my feelings about that really spring from 
this experience that, that I will share with you. Um, beginning in 2009, I became principal of St. Jerome School in Hyattsville, Maryland. Um, it's the school that I and my seven older brothers and sisters attended as kids. It's where I got my start teaching in 1990. So I taught, I was a vice principal, I was principal, I directed Christmas pageants, living stations, spring musicals, you name it. You all in Catholic Ed know the multiple hats that people wear, I wore them all. Um, loved the place dearly. Um, but I watched as the school uh, which opened in 1943, and it was uh, staffed by the Sisters of Notre Dame de Namur for most of its time. Um, watched as it dropped. Uh, when in, let's see, 2001, when I became vice principal, the school had 560 kids enrolled. I don't know if you remember the days of Catholic education when there was no sense of marketing a school. All you did was announce registration day and make sure you had enough parent volunteers to handle it. That's how it was when I started. So there was really uh, no communication of vision or mission. It was just a matter of saying, here we are. Um, and over the next 10 years, or nine years, I watched that number plummet till it finally bottomed out in 2009 at around 240 kids. And it would have continued to fall had the Archdiocese of Washington not stepped in and said to us, you have tripped a few wires that are raising red flags. One of them is your bleed of enrollment. Um, the only thing we had in uh, plentiful amount was debt. Um, we were running deficits of about 200,000, leading to debt around half a million. Very, very dire situation. So what it led to was a, a, a painful process, and I know some of you are in a painful process right now, so I'm going to ex share my experience and hope with you, um, that ultimately would have an outcome that, that has been phenomenal. The pastor, Father Stack, and I were required to go through this consultation process. At the time, it was a bit draconian. We had to meet on one day. And it was the, the Feast of All Souls, November 2nd. I'll never forget it. Three o'clock in the afternoon, we had to meet with faculty and staff, share with them the exact nature of our problems. Very painful thing to do. Then at six o'clock, we had to bring in the, the boards, the school advisory board, the parish council, the finance council, share with them. And then the real showstopper was 7.30 in the evening in the church, where the entire community was invited, and we had to share this. Um, painful difficult day. But what ended up happening, and I still have the vision, I still can see our, our superintendent, who at the time was uh, Patricia Whitesell O'Neill, now at Boston College, she was standing in the center aisle of the, of the church, and after the meeting was over, there was a line of parishioners, not school parents, parishioners, parishioners who did not put their children in our school, and they were lined up to tell her why. That they felt that the school despite being a warm and loving environment, and I'm here to tell you, it was. We had good people. We had people who loved children, gave them great experiences. But in their estimation, the school itself did not reflect in any way an authentic Catholic tradition of education. Essentially, it had become a contemporary secular school with religion lopped on top. A difficult indictment, but one that actually was true. What happened after that meeting was a whirlwind of forming boards and having people come forward. We were blessed at St. Jerome to live about uh, a mile and a half from Catholic University. So we had a number of parishioners who were CUA professors who had been thinkers about uh, Catholic education and where it had gone wrong. And they stepped forward and said, we're here to help. Um, what they did initially was they tried to investigate curricula that was out there that would reflect better the church's tradition. And they found nada, really. Um, much of the work around what we're calling classical education had been done, guess where? Protestant evangelical schools. They picked it up. Church dropped it. They picked it up, kind of ran with it. Um, in fact, my first conference 
of classical education was the Association of Christian Classical Schools in Dallas. I walked into a ballroom, 2,000 teachers. And I'm pretty sure I was the only Catholic. You know, so, and it was interesting to watch them have to go back into a history that they, <coughs> you know, pretty much reject doctrinally, but they know they have to have it there educationally. So it's just, it was just interesting. So what ended up happening was this volunteer group got together and they wrote an original plan. And it's uh, the educational plan of St. Jerome Academy. It's available on the school's website. Um, it's, it's there as an offering to other schools, to the church. Uh, we always say, you know, if, if you'd like to send a donation back to St. Jerome, they would certainly appreciate it. But it is there um, for anyone who is interested in looking at the principles. Um, it's not without its storms. This morning, uh, Father, tell me your name, Father Brian from Detroit. We were talking about the civil wars that erupt sometimes in parishes. We had a civil war. Um, erupt. So imagine trying to do this, and uh, at, at the same time, Father had to make a painful, difficult, but necessary decision to end uh, the mission of the only two sisters that remained um, from the original order. This created quite a backlash, um, resulting in one particular day of school dismissal, and the bell just rang, and I'm on my way out to do carpool line, and my secretary says, oh, there's a news channel 8 truck outside. <laughs> you know, is it true that you're putting nuns in the street? You know, it was just, um, and sister, I assure you, no nuns were harmed um, <laughs> in the process. It was, it was really a nightmarish time. And I worried tremendously. And this is where you knew that the Holy Spirit intended for this to happen and had it the whole time and basically had me like this because I was petrified. Can you imagine, I already have a failing school with a bad reputation. And now it's hit the news. On top of everything, we throw nuns out. Um, who's going to register to come to this school? I just couldn't fathom. But we proceeded. We moved on. Um, that storm, incidentally, and I know we hate them when they come, but storms do clear the air, except for this morning in New Jersey, where it's still a tropical nightmare. Um, what happened was we had probably 30 to 40% of the faculty leave in anger. And it was a good thing. It was a good thing. Because it allowed us then to bring people who were dedicated to this vision that we had just begun to articulate. And I was telling someone this morning, during that period of time, I never hosted a position for hire. People heard about it, and they sent me their incredible resumes um, from places like Thomas Aquinas College and University of Dallas and Franciscan and Christendom, I was getting a flood of on fire young Catholic folk with liberal arts, theology, philosophy degrees, nary an education major in the mix. And I brought them on. <coughs> and together with our written plan, we started a process of bringing a school around, a school that really, by all rights, probably should have closed. Um, but think. The Holy Spirit that it that it did not. Um, so the approach that we adopted, and it's interesting. Um, I'm saying classical as a shorthand. Uh, it reminds me, though, do you remember a couple decades ago when Coca-Cola changed its formula? Right. Remember this? Uh, New Coke, and it was a disaster. Everybody hated it. So what did Coca-Cola do? They rebranded their original formula as classic. So this is what I'm really talking about. What I'm talking about is essentially a deeply Catholic presentation that for shorthand Coca-Cola purposes, I'm calling classical, okay? And I wanna talk a little bit about some of the characteristics of that. Um, I'll start with a quote from uh, our Holy Father, John Paul II, speaking in Chicago. So Catholic education aims not only to communicate facts, but also to transmit a coherent, <clears throat> comprehensive vision of life in the conviction that the truths contained in that vision liberate students in the most profound meaning of human freedom. <clears throat> the best <clears throat> definition of Catholic education I think I've ever come across. And if I, if I may edit a saint's quote, the only thing I might throw in there is teacher too. This liberates teachers. Right? What I saw happening was teachers freed 
away from standards binders this thick, from pacing guides that say, I don't care about that individual kid. By December, you need to have covered these things, right? So we completely threw those things out, and we adopted a program that has much to say, and I would invite you to look at it, but I'll give you just four characteristics. The first one is that it is a logocentric approach. It embraces our Catholic understanding that there is an ordering principle in creation and that that ordering principle is Jesus Christ. Knowledge finds its natural, integrated end in him. All things were made through him. All things were made for him. He is before all else. This is a foundational understanding and an intentionality now of teachers so that we, we understand not that I'm over here teaching this little grammar lesson, but what I'm actually doing is helping to form an intellect to express meaning a little bit better, to grow a little bit closer to him who is the end of all knowledge. So you're looking at a curriculum that is described as integrated, but it's not a matter of us integrating. It already is. It's a matter of us pulling back a curtain and inviting our students to discover the natural connections between all of these areas of knowledge. You know, when we classify in science, and we also <coughs> classify in literature, and we classify in history, Little elementary school kids begin to see, oh, this is, this is just like that. And it fires open pathways. We all experience this. You know when you discover something and you realize it's just like the thing you read last week and you go, oh, and a light comes on. This happens all of the time in an integrated classical approach. So one practical dimension of this and, and I will say this, if you can do nothing else at your school, if you're just too far up against negative opinion or what have you, this is something I would, I would propose that you could do without having to say a peep about it at the Home and School Association, it would be to change the way you teach things like social studies, get that, rid of that word, <coughs> call it history, and integrate it with literature and religion. Bring back a humanities core program, okay? So that alone, and I've talked to people in my previous two years on the road for ICLE, so I was on the road, um, and I was. Um, sometimes I, I had to talk to people who, uh, leaders, pastors, who understood the goodness of this, but who said, my community, mm. You say something like, they, they think STEM is the answer. They think, so, okay, just begin this process. Get rid of the social studies books. Switch over to primary source documents. Find literature that integrates. Study lives of saints, church history along with that. When you study a concept like freedom, so I was telling the story this morning, uh, the eighth grade of St. Jerome studies American history. So the introductory unit is this concept of freedom. What is freedom? And the goal of this is that the student would digest multiple models and then be able to articulate himself <clears throat> what freedom is. So in that unit, they're studying freedom by reading founding documents of the United States, papal encyclicals, catechism of the Catholic Church, lives of the saints, reading a novel about the life of a slave, I, Juan de Pereja. So you can see at the end of this, the student has a very complex textured experience of freedom. Now, if I had a pacing guide and I had to get through this, I'm probably just going to put a definition on the board and say, write it down. Write it down and on the quiz, explain it. Explain what you think it means. So that's just one contrast in terms of what we mean when we say classical education. The second characteristic, which carries right from that, is the intentionality <clears throat> around an historic framework. I always saw St. Jerome's plan as having sort of 
twin arcs, if you will. One of them is the arc of salvation history, and the other is the arc of Western civilization. And that becomes the ordering framework for the school. So what does that look like? Well, our kindergarten studies the cradle of civilization. Ancient Egypt, Mesopotamia, the Old Testament lands. First grade, Greeks. Second grade, Romans. Third grade, Middle Ages. Fourth grade, the modern year and the Renaissance. Fifth grade, the American year. And that ends a segment of um, our curriculum, which is based on trivium, grammar, logic, and rhetoric. That would be sort of the grammar phase. The logic phase would pick up in sixth grade with a revisiting of classical cultures of Egypt, Greece, uh, pagan Rome, Christian Rome. Seventh grade, revisiting Christendom, Middle Ages, and eighth grade, revisiting U.S. history. So you can see how um, each student gets to, to sort of experience the curriculum, the historical period, twice. And that historical period is fully integrated with the literature, with art, with music. The approach to writing derives from this. Just a quick principle about the fact that we keep, you know, as we've segmented and fragmented curriculum, you know, and what happens to your school budgets is everybody has to buy a separate program for every little thing, right? Children in elementary school should be writing about shared reading experiences. You know, they should do short, responsive pieces to what they have read and studied together. And that's the beauty of an integrated approach because they're, they're able to think more deeply, you have a lot of discussion about it, and then the child is invited to write. The literature is important because literature uniquely shines a light on an historic period. Also, it gives a more uh, a dimension of human experience. And of course, you want to incorporate things like lives of the saints. So, you know, if you're um, uh, in the, certainly in the Middle Ages, the great, you know, as our, our third graders study uh, the monastic rule, Saint Benedict, they build model monasteries, right? Um, and they're reading about the saint, so that the experience is very, very full and very meaningful, and really. The buzzword in education about it being fun. Well, no, it's not always fun because learning things can be hard. We know that. But the fun part is being able to engage the imagination and the senses in a way that your um, social studies workbook does not do. And you pay a lot of money for those social studies workbooks. The third characteristic flows from the previous two. And that is also reflected in the Holy See's teaching an ordering and integrated Christian anthropology, understanding the nature of the human person. The recent release of Male and Female, which Father Peter shared with us yesterday from the Congregation on Catholic Education, goes a long way to forming our Catholic school teachers and administrators around this. Frankly, it has been absent for a very long time. It has fallen victim to fragmentation, to not being able to study something at great depth, to parsing out the curriculum. You know, this morning at breakfast we were discussing how, you know, in a, in a classical program, you can take something like the parable of the prodigal son, right, and you study this at depth. They're, they're not looking at it in a textbook, which gives you maybe a snippet and then they answer like two or three questions. But the actual parable itself, they're invited to study it, to look for patterns, to stand back, to discuss it together, to delve deeply into the experience of the figures, to find Jesus in parables, right? It was interesting because I, I walked into a classroom and they were doing this, I think it was seventh grade, and um, one of the kids said, you know, I wonder if the, the older son was angry because, you know, maybe, maybe the calf was being fattened for him. Maybe there was something he was about to do, like get married or, or something. And he felt that something had been taken from him. It was a very, um, it was the kind of insight that only comes when you're allowed to really study something at multiple levels and the multiple levels of meaning 
uh, that we find in scripture. It also um, is the, the foundation for helping our kids to process those sensitive, difficult subjects. They all revert to this concept of the nature of the human person. You know, whether it's uh, abortion, whether it's the issues around uh, gender dysphoria, all of them begin here. And if we can begin to form our kids, and I would say this, when you make the decision to form kids around this, you're really forming your teachers too. You buy a program like Rua Woods, which is a K-12 program, ordered to Christian anthropology and very well integrated with um, literature. As the teacher is studying it to teach it, they're learning it. Yesterday, um, uh, Sister Mary Mark talked about the um, giving the acre test to teachers because our teachers have huge gaps because they weren't formed this way, we weren't formed this way. So don't worry about that. Get the program, start working with the teachers so that they can then in turn work with the, the children. And the fourth <laughs> characteristic is, it, is an understanding of the nature of learning itself that begins in wonder and arrives at mastery. So as a general principle, we are studying fewer things but at greater depth. So it's not a march through a 500-page textbook. It's a, it's a discernment on the part of the teacher about which topics and concepts best serve the ultimate end, right? Which best illustrates for students the nature of truth, the nature of the human person. Okay, it's an elevated way of considering this. Math and science are STEM subjects. Right, everybody's also STEM. I would say for administrators and foundations, governance is the answer. For like almost everybody else, it's STEM or STREAM or STEAM or you know whatever acronym. But if you teach according to this approach, which really calls us to teach from the whole to the part, right? So little children, science should be a sketchbook. They should be outside in nature. We want them to be able to look closely at something and render it properly. This is cultivating a habit and virtue of science. But it's wrong to think about a first grader doing science. That's, that's inappropriate. It's developmentally uh, false. It pleases adults, <laughs> right? And we chest thump about what little kids can do. And we all know that that's not actually happening. Right, so um, fewer things at greater depth, movement from whole to part. So as they're studying, like our first graders are carefully drawing birds, right? They'll spend a week looking at birds. And really what they're doing is they're trying to develop a sense of birdness, the essence of bird. Not to be ornithologists, right? But later on in sixth grade, life science, now we're gonna start studying those parts, biology. We're gonna take a look at the elements that, of, of aerodynamics that help birds fly, but not yet. In first grade, we just want to appreciate the beauty of them. And then next week when we study fish, we'll contrast how they're different from birds. All of these things, by the way, are the development of teaching children to think. You know, uh, critical thinking is another flag that gets waved a lot in education. And most of the time when I've seen it, it's just been a particular page in the workbook called critical thinking activity or something, right? But that's, that's artificial. Critical thinking ar arises from material that arouses it. You know, you're not gonna be able to get much critical thinking about the Basil Reader program about Susie and Johnny built a birdhouse but you're gonna get some critical thinking about the wanderings of Odysseus in Greek mythology and lives of saints. So the, the material itself pushes up for kids this, this kind of curiosity that leads to the type of critical thinking we're looking for. I'm gonna close by just reading to you the vision statement of St. Jerome Academy that is the beginning of the educational plan. It says, St. Jerome Academy educates children in the truest and fullest sense 
by giving them the necessary tools of learning and by fostering wonder and love for all that is genuinely true, good, and beautiful. We emphasize classical learning because we want our students to read well, speak well, and think well, and ultimately because truth and beauty are good in themselves and desirable for their own sake. We seek to incorporate our students into the wisdom of 2,000 years of Catholic thought, history, culture, and arts so that they might understand themselves and their world in the light of the truth and acquire the character to live happy and integrated lives in the service of God and others. Education in this deep and comprehensive sense extends beyond the classroom and is more than just the acquisition of skills. It encompasses the whole of one's life. For this reason, St. Jerome seeks to involve families ever more deeply in the life of the school and in the education of their children. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Let me just give uh, two anecdotes. What year did I visit your office? I think it was 2010 or was 2011, year something the, like that, yeah. yeah. And uh, I spent a day there, and I was trooping around, and, and of course they start, you started the little ones, what, first grade with Latin? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And I walked into a first grade class which happened to be doing Latin. Now we're talking about baby Latin, but we have baby English too. I mean, you know, right. so they're not doing Virgil's and needed in first grade, all right? Uh, but I walked in and it was conversational stuff, and I, I looked at the book, and, and so I said to the class, Quinagis. And the little guy said, Bene. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, pointed at another kid, I said, Quinagis. He said, Optime. And I said to another kid, Quinagis. He said, Tessie May. <laughs> but that's in first grade. And of course, the time to learn a language, a foreign language, is then. Yeah. Yep. The mind is supple. Right? Uh, and then I walked into a, a fourth grade class, and I said, what are we studying? And one of the kids said, we're starting World War II. <laughs> starting World War II. Same <laughs> on the playground. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and and so the teacher immediately said, well, we just began today. You know, you want to make sure that. And I said, well, what, what do you know? And they already knew the Axis powers and the allies and so forth. And I thought, not bad. And I said, well, let me ask you this. How did World War II get started? Now, remember, this is second grade, uh, fourth grade. The kid said, because they didn't end World War I right. That's critical thinking. Mm -hmm. okay? Thing. It's not the mantra. It's they were already taught to see connections to things, and if you're doing that in fourth grade, I mean. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's been a it's been a joy, and I should tell you as a epilogue, you know, just that this I think I did share this with the school today is thriving. Um, we uh, about three years after this, we incorporated a Montessori preschool, which has been extremely successful, and we are thrilled this year that two. Dominican sisters will be on the faculty at St. Jerome Academy. So just thrilled about that. Um, the school is now trying to figure out where to put all these kids um, who have flooded. Truly, uh, people bought, buy homes in the neighborhood in order to put their kids at St. Jerome. And I, I, this is astounding because St. Jerome, before this, was not, you know, I had just really one quick anecdote and I will sit down. I had the, the premier realtor in the neighborhood, you know how every neighborhood has their person that advertises <laughs> in the bulletin. And you know, she, she shared with me, she said, you know, um, I just, I need to tell you something. Your school doesn't have a good reputation. When parents are gathering at the soccer field and trying to decide where to put their kids, the word is don't go to St. Jerome's. This is before. This was the brand of the schools is what people thought. So the fact that now it's become a destination place is quite amazing and it's entirely because we embrace this fully. And, you know, I'm, I'm certainly, and I, I know that the Institute for Catholic Liberal Education stands ready to support you um, if you're interested in, in pursuing this, even in a small way, um, in your own school. So, thank you. So this morning, I'm going to talk about classical education, not necessarily uh, regarding the methodology, but more so the planning and the logistics. Uh, essentially, the takeaways about how to get this done, especially given 
uh, certain things that happen within particular archdiocese or diocese, whether that could be a concern or questions that come from a bishop, uh, whether we're talking about parents uh, or even teachers, to make sure that this is going to be implemented in such a way that it's not going to have a lot of uh, negative feelings or, or so, something that perhaps could be terrible for the community. Uh, so I'm going to talk about this really from the perspective of two different archdioceses. Uh, my former archdiocese of Denver, in addition to the archdiocese of Detroit. Uh, so when I arrived in Denver, we already had a classical school, a Lord's Classical. Uh, several of you probably already have heard about it or read about it. Uh, it's a great classical school. Uh, to give you sort of a, a synopsized version about their story, uh, when they decided to go classical or go the classical route, they only had about 100 students at the time. Today, uh, they are at full capacity. They have a waiting list. And in fact, I just recently heard, talking to Rosemary Anderson myself, uh, who is the principal that brought it through the transition and still is the principal, that they're going to be possibly doing a parochial high school there to actually have a K-12 through option. Uh, so that existed prior to my arrival. My experience, though, regarding starting a classical school happens to deal with Frizzati Catholic Academy. It's an interesting story in the sense that uh, in Thornton, Colorado, uh, just a little bit north of Denver, uh, the Archbishop, the CFO, the Vicar General, and I saw an opportunity. There's a, a charter school that was closing uh, because they wanted to move to a bigger facility. Uh, so what we decided to do was to sort of take a look into that opportunity. <laughs> Uh, and we were told, uh, the CFO, Keith Parsons, and I, well, this is a nice idea, but let's maybe wait till later. We didn't wait till later. CFO and I decided we're going to take a tour of this facility, and we were able to take a look at it. Everything included, the building, which was relatively brand new, all the fixtures, desks, everything in there <coughs> for a pretty reasonable sum. Because if we would have to buy the land and also buy this uh, or build the school, it would cost twice as much. Uh, so we decided, okay, this is something worth pursuing. And then we also looked at the homeschooling community in the area. Uh, and the homeschoolers really wanted to have classical education, as the others are, that will be uh, presenting today or Mary Pat uh, has said before, <coughs> you're able to get a lot of homeschoolers into this. Uh, so after we looked at everything, we said, okay, all systems go. And then we bought the property. Uh, and then we had to hire a headmaster, and then we worked collegially with the local parishes in the area, promoted the heck out of it, and Frizzati Catholic Academy was born. And actually, the very first day of school uh, was back in 2017 when I believe we had the solar eclipse. And the Archbishop was able to celebrate Mass, uh, Archbishop Aquila, and said, this is God winking at you right now. So that was great. Uh, you can see all that great stuff online. Uh, but that was something that we wanted to do overall as part of a strategic vision that we had for the Archdiocese of Denver that we did for schools called Worthy of the Name. What makes our schools worthy of the moniker or the term Catholic? And this was one part of several things that we wanted to do in the Archdiocese of Denver in order to really increase uh, the Catholicity of our schools, but also the value propositions using some of that marketing terminology. It's really important that we meet parents where they're at. And certainly when it comes to millennial parents, it's very popular. As you heard just a few moments ago, parents are looking for these options. They perhaps don't know a lot about uh, ancient Greece or Rome. They may think it's just cool that the kids are learning Latin and studying uh, old, dead, profound Greek uh, and Roman men. And perhaps that's their intent or sort of what they're coming to classical education with. Uh, but again, we heard about this reverse evangelization from father. This is a great way in order to reach these parents. So that's what we did in Denver. Now, moving to the Archdiocese of Detroit, we have a similar vision. Uh, it's called Unleashing Our Catholic Schools. Uh, and it's really about unleashing the potential of what our, our Catholic schools have. If you'd like to learn more about that vision, you could take a look online, just type on Leishner Catholic Schools. The story, in addition to the glossy PDF, will come up. But what is important in that particular document, among so many other things, but the academically excellent piece or prong, is that we explicitly state within that vision, 
We want to have classical education as a viable and readily accessible option in the Archdiocese of Detroit. Coming into the Archdiocese, we don't have classical education there in terms of any officially recognized Archdiocese in school. Uh, so what we decided to do was, okay, we're going to get a jump start on this process. And you're truly having grown up in Detroit and not having the gift of a classical education. Uh, it's not that we wanted to make things more difficult, but we said we're not going to go to an affluent place. We're not going to go to suburban Oakland County, for example. We're going to do this in a place, not that I did this personally because of my experience, but in a place where kids grew up in an socioeconomic demographic that was kind of similar to my own and families that really wanted to have something like this. Uh, the pastor uh, of the particular place, Christ the Good Shepherd, uh, the pastor, his name is Father uh, David Beechel, wonderful gentleman, uh, a little younger uh, than uh, Father Hurley over here, he's about my age. Uh, he celebrates both the ordinary and the extraordinary form of the Mass. Uh, but we said, and I, I remember approaching him about this, uh, and I said, Father, what do you think about this idea? We can do this with your school. He looked at me, he's like, Kevin, you're nuts. That's what he said to me. No one's going to want to do this. And I said, well, you know, I'm not going to force anything on you because, again, as rightfully said before, who the heck am I other than just really the delegate of the Archbishop for education? Uh, but we are here to present this to you, Father, as an opportunity. And he brought it to prayer and he thought about it. And he was able to talk about it with some other people. And he said, I'm willing to give this a try. So what did we do? Uh, we actually, and I'll talk about the governance part of this a little bit. Governance is not always, you know, the, the panacea or the cure-all. Uh, but we decided in order to get, a, get the philanthropic support that we needed, uh, we would actually have a board of specified jurisdiction, where the pastor still retains all rights and abilities to monitor the Catholic faith, morals, and values of the institution. That's very important. Uh, but we would have a group of individuals, seminary professors, for example, in addition to uh, several members uh, in the philanthropic community that were able to sit on this board. Again, this is not the most well-to-do school, uh, but think about the transformation that we could make uh, at the school. And by the way, the school is now called John Paul II Classical School. Uh, so right away, as part of this planning process, I contacted our friends at ICL or ICLE, uh, and I remember working with Mary Pat uh, Elizabeth uh, in Denver, in addition to Dr. Andrew Seeley at the time. Uh, but now here in Detroit, uh, we are working really with Elizabeth Sullivan, and it's going well. So Elizabeth, how about we actually have you, if you have time in your busy schedule, to come out to train the faculty at JP2, to let them know what classical education is about, uh, to really assure them then that, that they can do this. Uh, and we don't necessarily need to have like another certification. It's not that we have to hire a lot of other people. Uh, and she did it. And it went really well from everything I was told. I actually had to be at a different meeting that day out of state, uh, but it went really well. And in fact, I even sent uh, the pastor, uh, Father Beachel, in addition to the principal, Marianne, to Denver for an equal conference as well, where they were able to take a look at Our Lady of Wards. They loved it tremendously. I still remember when I met along with pastor with the faculty, letting them know officially before the big announcement to all the parents that this was going to happen. There was no gnashing of teeth. There, was, there were really no tears. If there were tears, there were tears of joy. People want to do this type of stuff. The teachers want to do it. The parents really are excited about this because later on that day, I met with all the parents. Uh, and we had our teacher bleachers in the back where the teachers were sitting. The parents were there and it was wonderful. Talking about how this process is going to look like. Letting them, letting them know that the first year is going to be all about a transition. We're not going to expect a kid in 7th or 8th grade to have Latin proficiency of a 7th or 8th grader, perhaps. Uh, but we're going to be able to build this up over time. Uh, and the parents were very receptive about it. The philanthropic community loved it in order to support that school. Uh, and it's so successful in the way that it was received in the Archdiocese. In fact, on August 12th, Elizabeth Sullivan, we have invited her to come to the Archdiocese in order to uh, give a day of exploration, we're putting it that way, uh, for a group of our Catholic schools where it's going to be the pastor, principal, uh, members of the local philanthropic community, members of the faculty, in addition uh, to parents. 
where they're going to be able to come as a leadership team and hear this and learn more about it. So when we look at all of this, uh, we had actually, I think, 25 schools, 25 elementary schools that really wanted to do this. We told the pastors as well, this is only possible if you're able to make this. 25. We identified 12 because we don't want to have people, I think I put some to sleep, but we don't want to have people so closely congregated together uh, where we have like two or three classical schools right next to each other. That's why we picked 12. We picked a, a nice dozen. Maybe I'll end up being in Baker's dozen. We'll maybe have 13. Uh, Father Hurley's school uh, is going to be one of the schools that we'll be attending. Uh, but this whole upcoming academic year for the schools are selected for that August 12th session. It's going to be a year of planning. We got to make sure we cross all of our T's, dot all of our I's, make sure that we have faculty at the local level being able to talk about this, making sure that we have the philanthropic support. And granted, it's really not that expensive to do, to be honest with you. Yeah. You know, it's just more a change of mindset and culture, which can happen really well over the course of a year, as opposed to doing it maybe over the course of like two weeks. Uh, that's not yeah, necessarily enough time. Workbooks, it frees up a lot of your budget. Right, <laughs> right, yeah. So overall, this is something that the Archbishop and I are very much looking forward to doing and implementing in the Archdiocese of Detroit over the next several years. Again, in terms of the cadence and the logistics, those 12 schools that go through this process, I'm going to just guess right now, maybe eight of them are gonna be really serious about doing it. And it doesn't mean that all eight need to come online for the upcoming academic year. It could be staggered somewhat uh, because you know logistics and bandwidth, I, I know that when it comes to ICLE, they do the training really well. I know that, for example, uh, you know, Mrs. Sullivan over here is not gonna be able to get to every single school. Uh, but this is also why in part we hired a brand new associate superintendent uh, from the Diocese of Lincoln, uh, and she'll be starting with us on the 25th. Uh, that actually was a principal of a classical school for the last 10 years. So we have a subject matter expert as well. Uh, I can say a few things in Latin because of my legal background and things like that. Uh, but here are the takeaways that I really have to share because I know that the other is going to be able to get in the substance. And, and who can argue with this? What pastor, what parent can argue with this? That really it's those three transcendentals that we're teaching. That's truth, beauty, and goodness. I mean, people cannot argue with that. And when you talk about the really the methodology of grammar, logic, and rhetoric, that's how our kids need to learn. It's wonderful. And you don't need a lot of equipment. You just need to have some consumables or some materials and some training. You can do it. It's not going to work everywhere, I think, in, in every single Catholic school in the Archdiocese of Detroit. But, I mean, if the local communities bought in and were able to have those value propositions of classical education in conjunction with, like for example, we're working right now with the University of Notre Dame uh, with their STEM education initiative. And we're not gonna do this stream and all these other things. It's a whole bunch of nonsense in my opinion. It's just classical, I'm sorry, we have classical schools, we're gonna have Catholic STEM schools as well. Give parents a choice. If they wanna send their kid to a STEM school, great. If they wanna go to a classical school, wonderful. Maybe one last thing to note in closing, and that is when it comes to Father Beechill, uh, he will actually be offering Mass four times a week with his children. And we actually have uh, g uh, very generous with their time uh, pastors in the local area that will be able to celebrate Mass too. And we made this very clear, even though we don't need to have explicit permission, but we wanted to make sure it was codified. Uh, Father Beechill will be able to celebrate both the extraordinary form of the Mass in addition to the ordinary form on a regular basis uh, every week. Um, we'll keep the, you know, extraordinary, extraordinary in the sense of maybe like one or two Masses a week. And then we'll have the, the Novus Ordo or the ordinary form of the Mass. You would be probably surprised or maybe not surprised uh, that we have people that want to come to that. Classical education, let me just say maybe one other thing and then I'm truly done. Uh, and that is, it, it's not for the holier than thou crowd. We know those people that exist where they think that the Novus Ordo or the ordinary form of the Mass is invalid or there are problems. There's nothing wrong with the ordinary form of the Mass. It just depends upon what parish you go to, you know, how the gentleman is following the, you know, general instruction, the Roman Missal or the germ. You know, I'm a big fan of, of what Father Zolstorff says, and that is, you know, say the black and do the red. Just, just stick to that. It works, right? <laughs> 
Uh, but we're going to have both forms of the Mass are going to be celebrated there, and that is a big attraction for a lot of kids. By the way, actually using Latin in the Mass, where the kids are going to be able to offer responses, for example, to Novus Ordo and other things, how wonderful is that? Talk about actually getting your feet wet and using what you're able to learn. Overall, my experience with uh, Ickler ICLE has been wonderful. Um, I would encourage you gentlemen to look at this at the diocesan level. Uh, depending upon where you gentlemen hail from, you may have a more difficult time than other places. I won't mention the name out of the diocese uh, out of Christian charity, but there is a diocese in Michigan uh, where they are looking at doing this, and the ordinary there does not want this to happen. So we're fortunate that the Archbishop in Detroit is willing to give this a shot. But I'll stop talking and I'll turn this over to the folks from ICLE so they could talk a little bit more about the actual methodology. And I also passed out my card. You sort of want to talk about the logistical elements, about how to do this, how to interact with the superintendent or the chancery. I'm happy to do that. So thank you so much. had the benefit as a family to uh, travel to several countries around the world and one of the beautiful things that we run into is Latin in the mass and you want to talk about diversity and unity what a beautiful thing a common language for our church gives us Do you and, remember Mike the stupid comment made after Vatican II the great thing about the Latin Mass in the old days was you go anywhere in the world and not understand it. You talk about stupid, right? But that was taken as a mantra, right? <laughs> yeah. And what have we done but balkanized the church? Huh? That's, right. That's right. There there are numerous parishes, one just had its 100th anniversary. They have five weekend Masses in four different languages. And then they were going to have an anniversary Mass. Well, what language out with this ethnic group and this Filipino group doesn't want to be involved with the Ethiopians who don't want to be involved with the Chinese because they've been living in cocoons for the past 30 years. Right? So anyway, I can resist. So I mentioned the other day that one of the things that our school does, and, and we've heard this over and over, the importance of aesthetics in, in the education. Um, I just wanted to share 30 seconds or so with you about what what this produces in our children after several years of being compelled to, to sing. Uh, at the very beginning, it was a little difficult. Boys naturally did not want to sing. And the, uh, the whole idea of many of them singing when they think they can't just didn't, didn't sit well. But over the years, all of a sudden what's happened is they have sung, they have followed the direction, and they have created beautiful music. And it's, it's, it's so uh, awe-inspiring to me sitting in my office hearing the high school choir singing and, and really nailing it. And then they clap for themselves because they know they, they achieved that harmony that was intended by the composer. And they recognize it and then they've grown into it. And now it's become part of the culture and so this is a little high school, 72 kids, um, compulsory choir.
one little tiny sliver of the kind of education that we're giving these children. And these are normal kids. But we're opening them up to that, to that real depth. As, as I was uh, reflecting on uh, what I was going to say and how best to get across what, what I have in my heart, the, the idea of iron ore came to mind. Um, I was with Elizabeth yesterday, and she was saying up in the part of New Jersey where her house is, there's, they were famous for their ore mines, right? And they created iron out of it. Or think of the ore, the, the tons and tons of ore that we have to mine in order to get a little bit of gold, right? And that takes a long time. It takes a lot of money. It takes a lot of effort. But at the end, you get this precious, precious substance. And so today, we, we are just inundated with the latest educational fad, the edu latest educational materials. It just keeps coming like, like, a, like a railroad train of 120 cars, barreling down the tracks and expecting us to, to try to keep up with it. Um, Mary Pat mentioned the large standards books. That's what we have to do as teachers. That's what we're trained to do in ed school. And if we think about it, that's, that's sort of the whole or approach to education. And I'm thinking, we have all this precious substance at our fingertips. Why don't we steep the children in the already mined ore and teach them about the precious things that are right in front of them? We, we have 2,500 years of wisdom, of thought, of suffering, of trial, of pain, of argument. And so much good has come out of it. Yesterday we heard Mother Mary Mark talk about the, the progression of philosophy and how philosophy progressed and progressed and progressed and progressed. And then it went, uh, and then it went, uh, and now it's gone off a cliff. <clears throat> Who would have imagined 30 years ago we'd be in this gender problem that we're in in America, where really good people are really confused. But they love each other, right? Why not? Even really good people. So that philosophy has really taken us off of a cliff. And what do we need to do? I think what Mother was saying was we need to go back and reestablish a proper philosophy. And as Mary Pat was saying, if, if we find our teachers already formed in the basics, in the fundamentals of philosophy and theology and literature and history, then we're starting with this really good material. We're really starting with the gold on our plates. And we can then transfer that to the children. We can transform them. We can do what the church asks of us, and that's a transference of culture. That's what our schools are about, a transference of culture. So Mary Pat talked about classical, and Kevin talked about classical. I invite you to think that that's a word, not a model, right? That's a word that we can use for a couple different purposes. One is it does become a great marketing tool. Because there are schools around us, sometimes charter schools, that identify as classical, and that's enticing to parents, and so they'll go off over there. Um, we might need to use the word classical to distinguish ourselves from others and invite people to our school. And they like that. In other cases, in other places, that's verboten. They think that will actually turn off the parents or turn off the community. So they wouldn't want to use that term. Um, another reason one might use it is simply, you don't think there's any big benefit or defect for using the word classical, but you see that if you take a new name and you identify with a new name, that gives you sort of permission, right? Permission to do something else, to try something else, to break with that railroad train that's been barreling. And so this, this is a, a moniker that can, 
can give you uh, a, new, a new path. But what I say is, and again, if we look over this 2,500 year arc, we look at the beginning of the Greek and Roman culture and thought, and then we see it totally transformed with the incarnation. And then that, that Greek and Roman culture, that doesn't mean anything anymore as a standalone. It's been informed, it's been transformed by the incarnation. And it gets perfected over the centuries, or improved over the centuries. It, it will never be perfect on this earth. But we come to that deeper and deeper understanding, that purer and purer form of that precious substance. We come to a, a, a deeper understanding of truth. What is truth? That's not a question our educational systems ask. And so this is what I would, pro if I was Pope, <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> I would propose that all of Catholic education be Catholic education. And if it's Catholic education, it is ordered towards one thing. It's ordered towards that logos. It's ordered towards truth. Truth himself and truth, the word that he has given us. So, um, Wow, where was I going with this? Um, oh, okay, so if truth then is our end, and again, Mother referenced this, the, this is the beauty of sticking to philosophy, is it, it orders you and directs you. Um, if, if you know your end, then you have a better chance of getting there. I was, I think, talking to Father last night. I said, if you're one or two degrees off on your little schedule, for flying to Milwaukee, you might end up in Pensacola. It doesn't take much of a deviation, but you're gonna end up in way the wrong place. And we don't wanna do that. So we need to know what our end is. And our end in Catholic education is simply truth. And truth is the person, and truth is the residue of that person through all of creation. So we're good to remind ourselves that truth is the conformity of the mind with or to reality. Now that's not something that's common again today. We live in a relativistic society. The educational machine, the educational system, it's all based on this relativism. So we want to think about it differently. We want to think about it in the Catholic way. And so if it's a STEM school or a stream school or a art school or whatever, it, it all has to be guided by truth, by teaching ourselves, as Mary Pat said so wonderfully, we, as we adopt these kinds of curriculums and these kinds of pedagogies, we're transforming our teachers. We're transforming ourselves. I mean, I've been in this business for a long time and I've, run schools and I've helped uh, helped schools change, I've helped schools start. I still feel like about a third grader in this business. I love learning every day, every week. Who is it said, brother, you said, never had a bad day of teaching. Totally agree with that. <laughs> um, no matter what comes to us, teaching is Great, and in part because you're learning. And if we're learning towards this, with this intellectual humility that I am going to submit myself to truth in any and every subject, and we give that to our kids, and we give that focus to our kids, and we give that interest and excitement to our kids, and we do it all with the joy that it has to that has to bubble up within us if we're pursuing these wonderful ends. What else is there? Why are we still in this, this rat race of, of the standards or whatever? As we saw on Monday night, was it Tuesday night? Tuesday night. Uh, we, we saw in the canon 804, 805, where it said that we have to make sure we're up with the latest or the local public school we're so far beyond that. If we pursue the educational ideals and models that gave us Western civilization, that, that developed 
under the guidance and wisdom of the Holy Mother Church, how can we not be so far beyond them? We're creating this, this, this great, free, <coughs> rightly directed young person to go into any industry. I got a list as part of a, um, I'm on the, the, uh, a board somewhere, and um, it was presented to us to consider for the schools in that diocese that we should look at these 19 models of education and see which one is best for our school. Now, of those models, one of them was classical. So they called it classical as just a model. And then it had the benefits and the defects and the kind of student it would be good for. <clears throat> it, it was just so wrong. <laughs> we, we can't think of classical as a model. All we can, what we should do is if we hear the word classical, we think that's a moniker that's trying to describe Catholic education in its core, in its essence, in its principle, in its tradition, in its patrimony. That's what we want to grasp onto. Beth gave a, a talk at uh, one of the largest dioceses in the United States. And at the very end, the, the, uh, the superintendent said, so you're saying we could actually do this in all our schools? <clears throat> of course. Not only can you, you should, because it's simply the principles <clears throat> that are at Catholic education. <coughs> um, Beth penned an article. I will invite, oh, I didn't introduce you. <laughs> Elizabeth Sullivan uh, has joined us this morning. She's the uh, executive director of the Institute for Catholic Liberal Education. Um, and if you will note, we were there at the very beginning of St. Jerome's helping them, but we're not titled classical education. We're titled Catholic Liberal Education because we are in that Catholic liberal arts tradition and we work with any school that wants to come back to the, the, the true uh, philosophy of education that, that we've developed and built over 2,500 years. So, I, And I say 2,500 because I want to go back uh, to include that Greek and Roman culture before Christ. Um, so I will invite Beth, if she, I'm sure she has some really important points that I've missed, so she can chime in here. But also, um, I will pop up on the screen in a moment an article that she just penned that came out this week in the NCEA's Momentum magazine, which is, uh, I think it's the largest teacher magazine for Catholic educators. Beth, would you come forward? And... Yeah, yes, sure. Please. Yeah. While Beth's coming up, just to, a couple of points. Uh, you know, Mike is talking about the mess of the culture. Uh, actually, I think the worse it gets, the easier it's going to be to bring it back from the brink. Absolutely. Uh, when, when things are sort of, well, you know, let it be. If, for example, I think if we had stuck with civil unions, people would say, oh, yeah, well, that's just to give people, you know, financial stuff and so forth. Well, now that we're at the marriage point, and now especially the marvelous thing with all the crazy gender stuff, huh? But what I find fascinating is normal people aren't there with the craziness, huh? When New York State went to the, the gender neutral bathrooms, okay, whatever that's supposed to mean. And as I've said to you many times, I'm in New York constantly, I'm in restaurants constantly. And when this first started, I'd be going to a restaurant restroom and a young man would be entering and he'd say, Oh, Father, I haven't figured out today which one I should use. Saying it mockingly, right? Not saying, oh, I'm, I'm confused about my gender today, all right? Uh, but the word gender, there is a very, very good school uh, uh, in the Archdiocese of Detroit. Uh, but they asked me to do some stuff for them, and they showed me their literature. And one of the things it mentioned was that they become gender-specific at seventh grade. And I said, you don't want to use the word gender. Well, what's wrong with it? I said, because that's a construct. Gender is a grammatical concept. It is not biological, all right? And, 
and, and these are people that are intelligent, of goodwill, but they had absorbed this from, from the overall culture. The second point, when, when Mike's repeatedly talking about the Greco-Roman contribution, I believe that one of the finest homilies John Paul ever gave, and it got almost no notice whatsoever, was on his visit to Sicily the first time. And, uh, and of course, once he condemned the mafia in Palermo, the media left and they weren't interested in anything else he had to say. But he went to Agrigento, which is the site of the best preserved Greek ruins in the world. The best Greek ruins are not in Greece. They're in Agrigento, Sicily, Magna Grecia. And there's a place in Agrigento called the Valley of the Temples, which has marvelously preserved Greek temples. And, uh, and they have what's called the Via Sacra, the sacred way. And there's a temple up this side, down that side, and it finally all merges at the Temple of Concord. And John Paul celebrated mass there using the altar of the Temple of Concord. And in his homily, he used the classical rhetorical technique called apostrophe, which is not the, the, the punctuation mark. It's addressing people who aren't there. And he said, I speak to you today, Diana. I speak to you today, Juno. I speak to you today, Jupiter. And he went down all of the gods and goddesses. And he said, and I say that the sacrifices offered in this place were not offered in vain. They were offered in view of this moment when the sacrifice of the Son of God will be celebrated on this altar. What a magnificent concept, huh? And it's what, of course, the fathers of the church referred to as the logoi spermaticoi, the seeds of the word that have been planted in man from the very beginning of time and how all of this was preparation. Mm -hmm. And again, the fathers called it the, the preparatio evangelica, preparation for the gospel. And so this is not simply you know, a trip down memory lane. It's, it's the seeds of the church that we're studying when we're studying the Greeks and the Romans. Interesting too, Seton Hall College Seminary, pre-Vatican II, was unite, unique in, I think, all American seminaries in that the seminarians were not required to major in philosophy. They were required to major in classical languages. Why? Because if you've got that, you've got the philosophy. So we did a course in Lucretius, that's philosophy, right? Cicero, de rerum natura, de senectute, all, this is studying philosophy in the original languages. Regrettably, in my time, they dropped it, but I still majored in classics. So all of that is so critically important, and we've lost that, and as a result, we've lost the roots. So you can't start Christianity with Christ, right? <laughs> Uh, that's what Marcion tried to do by getting rid of the Old Testament, right? And now other people want to get rid of the Greeks and the Romans. That's all part. And, and Benedict has a great thing about how the merger of these three cultures, right? the Greek, uh, Gre Greco-Roman, the, the, the Hebraic, and, and the Christian, what Paul calls that, what? The plenitude no temporis, the fullness of time. So. I'll pick up right there, <laughs> actually. <laughs> Part of the problem in our schools is that we don't know our story, and we're not handing on the story to our children, right? We haven't seen this chronological story of salvation history. How do we study history? We study it in little bits and pieces. We've got the 13 colonies over and over again, but we don't understand who we are in our story. Any cultural anthropologist will tell you that no people survive without their story. So one of the most powerful things, as Mary Pat mentioned, one of the first things we do is when we help a school transition is to recover this thread of salvation history and Western civilization, weaving through the history and the literature and the religion. Because we all learn by story. Think of how our Lord taught by parable, right? We respond to story. We understand this this way. Also, it's the human story. So even mathematics is really the study. It, until the 17th century, mathematics was really philosophy, right? It's not just the algorithms you have to do in algebra. I could have been a math person if someone had shown me Euclid in eighth grade, right? Um, it's just to engage the heart and the mind to see 
the bigger picture. I think everything is so fragmented and piecemeal in education that it is, it is not just dulling the mind, it's crushing the soul for these children. And so what's happening here is this recovery of really the only authentically human form of education there's ever been that began in the classical world. As the, our Lord prepared, you know, as God prepared the world for the coming of Christ, the Greeks and the Romans, as, as the St. Jerome people like to say, the gospel was spread on Roman roads, right? So from the ancient Greeks, you have, we take up two things from the ancient Greeks, right? The spirit of inquiry that is a search for truth and goodness and beauty, and the tools of the seven liberal arts, which are not those dreaded college majors that parents fear that their children will emerge from college without a job prospect, history and literature. No, they're the actual seven liberal arts, grammar, logic, rhetoric, the tools of language, um, the arts of language, and then um, uh, arithmetic, music, geometry, and astronomy or physics. So we don't just study those as subjects, we practice them because they are the tools of thinking that free our minds, right? The liberal arts that free us to see the truth of things. It's only 100 years ago that that all began to unravel because of a seismic shift in philosophy, right? So the church takes up that spirit of inquiry and the tools of the liberal arts. The ancients looked for the logos. They were searching for the ordering principle of the universe, but of course that's, that's answered in Christ. So this is no longer, after the Incarnation, it's not really classical education. It's something that we would call greater than that. It's liberal education. It's, it's liberal education. The term liberal education speaks more toward the telos, or the end, of what we're aiming for. Classical speaks to the roots and the, and the technique, but I think our institute calls it the, or call ourselves the Institute for Catholic Liberal Education because we're speaking about what we're ordered for, freedom in Christ the only place where you can really find true freedom. So to begin to um, repair the damage that's been done, I, I would say that, this, um, that the educational system in this country, the way it's fallen apart in the last 100 years, is actually causative of the anguish and despair. We are manufacturing anguish and despair, because what has modern education done? It's stripped away two things from education, meaning and purpose from all things. So this project is about restoring the meaning and the purpose of all things. And what does that produce in a child? Confidence and joy. And that's the telltale mark of every one of these schools almost immediately. You see, most of our Catholic schools are joyful communities. There's a lot of love, there's a lot of camaraderie, there's a lot of community. But is there actual joy in learning? I don't think you see that very much. That's why this is spreading, because it is not the fragmented mechanical education, it is a deeply human formation that responds to, to what these children need, beginning in wonder, leading them to wisdom. So the way it's spreading is that these kids are coming home at the dinner table, they're talking, they're bubbling over with uh, the Emperor Justinian <laughs> and his codex, and what this means, and the dads tell us that I have to go rifle through Catherine's backpack after she's gone to bed because I'm not quite up to speed on all this and I don't want to look foolish. But they're putting things together. It's deeply integrated. The connections between history and literature and music and mathematics, they're getting the big picture so that everything they learn then hangs on this framework and it's really satisfying. It's really exciting. So that's how it's spreading. Parents are seeing this difference in their children and they want it. So now I just have to tell you my story. The reason I am in this is for this very reason. So myself, my husband, all of our siblings, all of our families, we were all products of Catholic education all the way through university, and it's his case, in his case, graduate school. Catholic education was a priority for us. We were overseas. We moved back, chose a place where there was more Catholic schools because we knew that was a priority for our children. Our older sons went to the best Catholic schools all the way through. And we thought we were doing what we could. When our youngest son came along, um, by this time, so my first, I was a journalist before this. By the time my boys were in third and fourth grade, the older boys, I'm saying, why are my curious, inquisitive, intelligent boys bored out of their minds by third grade? What is wrong with education? There's so many things to choose from. There's, who can keep it all straight? There's different educational theories. And I kind of dove in to really try to understand these competing educational theories. 
Shortly after that, um, our diocese closed another 13 Catholic schools, and a group of lay people got together. Father Stravinskis was involved, and uh, this is in Rochester, New York. A bunch of lay people got together and said, we're going to open a school, whether it's in his living room with four kids or whatever. We're, we're going to do this, and we're going to um, be sure that it's faithful to the magisterium, have the charism of St. John Bosco, and be a classical liberal arts school. So the only problem, that was in 2008, Nobody quite knew what that was at the time, right? So this is Providence. I'm out. So, so I had been a journalist. The chairman of the board, who just recently passed away um, this week, um, he sent me out. He said, you're a reporter. You go find out what this is. I find myself on, with Dr. Andrew Seely, Institute for Catholic Liberal Education, on the one program he was running at the time. Mary Pat was there with the St. Jerome Educational Plan hot off the press. And I'm like, oh, I think we can do this. <laughs> yeah, 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 it was hot off the press. She was in, her for, in the throes of trying to understand what this was. I was in the throes of trying to understand what this was. This became a fast friendship where we, you know, we all wind up working together. But what I have to tell well, you... not quite true, with incredible hostility from the diocese. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's another with piece of With the media this. there for that opening that's meeting. Right. Do you remember that? That's right. I was there. <laughs> I was there. But parents yearned for this. I could see that something was broken. Why in the world would we imitate a completely broken educational system, which, it, which is not founded on truth? It portrays uh, a world that is fragmented, detached, changing, and chaotic, right? That, isn't, that is not the eyes of faith. That's not looking at the world through the eyes of faith. So what I'm here to tell you is that the difference in our youngest child in this little fledgling school that was doing it a little bit sloppily at the beginning, was so profound that, and I wound up teaching in the school, and the, the difference in the children there was so profound. Their love of learning, their, their joy in their faith, their understanding of their faith. So this is not just about formation of the intellect, right? This is formation of the soul, and I've seen it in my own home. This is a child who at nine years old was writing essays like, What's the meaning of St. Thomas More's last words? I die the king's servant, but God's first. My nine-year-old writes this beautiful essay, essentially about the difference between divine authority and temporal authority. And I'll never forget the last sentence is, but Jesus is my true king, right? And so we were so determined St. John Bosco did not have a high school at this time. My <laughs> husband and I said, we will do anything to continue this formation in our child. We moved so that we could find it. Um, and, and now I'm so passionate about it. I work for the Institute and, and just promised God I would do all I could do to get this out there because what my youngest child has is what I'm going to call a sacramental imagination, right? He sees God permeating the world in every way. So in high school chemistry, he'll, he comes home and says, Mom, I love chemistry. It's like God's coding for the universe, Right? This is what we're after. The world is a different place through the eyes of faith. We need to show these children that, just the hope, right? Wonder and hope have the same structure, right? There's no hope among the young because there is no wonder, right? These are the, it's the same structure. The despair that this educational system is producing is very visible in the culture. And so this is the cure. This is the antidote. There's only one philosophy of Catholic education. And, and this is it. This is a recovery of the church's tradition. Yep. And last word, our Lord gave us the way out. Because I know you are all, uh, many of you are compelled by your state or country to follow certain laws. Well, render under Caesar what you have to. Uh, if your teachers have to get credentialed, fine. If you have to make reports, fine. But that doesn't have to affect the ultimate core of how and what you educate with in your classrooms. So. Yes. I would recommend a, a book. And when I taught educational philosophy here, the first text I required the students to read was Jacques Maritain's mm -hmm. Education at the Crossroads. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with that? Mm -hmm. Yes. It was a series of lectures that he gave at uh, Columbia mm -hmm. Teachers College in 1947. I think there were four lectures. And when he got done with the series, the New York Times wrote an editorial excoriating him, 
how could you say such horrible things about American public education, which is the absolute zenith of education in the universe? But in 47, he already saw the mess of the whole thing that no one else was seeing. Huh? And, and now people say, how did he, 60 years ago he saw this? But it's the correct thing. Huh? But if you want to understand the problem, read that, because he identifies it all. And then you know where you need to be, because he's telling you what it should be. Uh, any questions for these folks? Uh, we're running a little off, but go ahead, brother. Just to, uh, thank you so much. I, I was so deeply, deeply moved and impressed by what you had to say. Just an experience that the way I tried to formulate it, what I noticed after teaching at St. Francis College for a number of years, that we, the reason itself is damaged enormously. Reason itself. And we're caught between, I think, two extremes. It's caught between the hyper analytical, the hyper rational that creates Microsoft and, and these vast, incredibly analytical systems. Or the other pole is the definitely libertine. Mm -hmm. Reason is enslaved to serving the worst passions and intentions like gender madness, abortion, and you know, some of the brightest young people will try to give you a rational account to defend these things. And, and, and so reason is, is enormously damaged. So I, that's what struck me so much about your presentation. It's the healing reason that the classical education uh, has one of its great Benefits. Yes. And, and so I want to thank you. It was really just thank, you. Thank, thank you. On the screen, all of you, thank you so much. The um, article in the NCA magazine is not coming up on the screen, but I did email that to Father, so Father could email it to you all. It's an article by Elizabeth, and it really centers on the one school out in California, in inner city, Hispanic, poor neighborhood, Holy Innocence in Long Beach. Um, staffed by the Carmelite Sisters, and it's a beautiful and powerful story. So uh, please read that. It's, it's very exciting. And please look at our website. There's so many resources on our website, including there, we just published a case study. So there are six schools, including um, St. Jerome Academy, Our Lady of Lourdes in Denver. There's a little story, um, St. Augustine Academy, my school. So there's case studies of the different kinds of measured improvements that you see immediately but it's joy because it's the joy of the lord and that's fundamentally what it is and so the one thing i want to say is that it's not about a curriculum or a program right it's about investing in human capital in teacher formation it is not the fault of these teachers that all teacher training in the last 50 years has been fundamentally secular and therefore erroneous right an indication yeah. that uh great minds think alike I'm going to be giving you this afternoon this pamphlet, this uh, booklet from Rua Woods. Yeah. <laughs> so let's take a 15 minute break.